All right, folks, you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. If you need a Bible, there's one in each row. You can take that home with you if you'd like. Um, while you're flipping to John chapter 18, so we're in a verse by verse Bible study. We just go verse by verse uh, through the Bible and we just kind of learn whatever God wants to teach us one verse at a time. We started this church in the beginning of John chapter one as uh, we felt like it was a very fitting place to study for a new church as we got to know the life of Jesus Christ. And uh, a lot of great places to do that. I felt like, man, the Gospel of John, uh, no wonder that God picked that for us as we launched this church. Um, and as we study our passage today in 18, um, something comes to mind. One thing I noticed that being a disciple of Christ comes with a number of paradoxes. A paradox. So what, what I mean, paradox is like a, a seemingly contradictory statement that is true nevertheless. So it's, it's a truth. Maybe you have like two factual truths that seem at first to cancel each other out, but the fact of them both being true is the same. A paradox is like a statement that contains what feels like a contradiction, but it delivers absolute truth. And there's a number of examples of this in the Christian life. Probably because our spirit's been resurrected by the Holy Spirit, who's a, of a kingdom that's outside this world, and and so his values and his ways are upside down, or I should say ours are upside down compared to his. One example of this, Jesus tells us that the life of the disciple of Christ is going to be both easy and hard at the same time. He says to be his disciple, it's going to cost you everything, including your life. You've got to die to self and then be made alive again in him. It's going to cost you everything. And then next breath, he tells us that by connecting our life to his in that way, we inherit eternal life and we get all the glory of God himself. He tells us that the road of a disciple is going to be very hard. And he warns us to count the cost before we follow him. He says it's going to come at a cost. It may cost you family. It may cost you a job. It may cost you. And he just gives all these examples. Out of, out of his own mouth, at the same time, he tells us that he's offering us peace that transcends this world and a joy that's absolutely complete. He tells us that to follow him, we might have to forsake everything. And he also tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he means both. As an immature Christian develops into maturity, we discover that every one of these statements are true, and they manifest themselves regularly in our life, even though they may sound contradictory at first. And so it's hard to understand when you're on the outside looking in, but as you're going through, you get it. Christianity is full of these sorts of paradoxes, which is a big part of why I think there's so many theological positions on various points. We get all this division in the body of Christ, and people tend to see things in either or mentality. Like, so either one is right or the other. And God seems to present us things in his word that confuse us because they're more both and mentality, like uh, showing us that both this and that are true at the same time somehow. And it is hard to understand. So for example, this, this is a classic example that I think most students of the Bible will have heard of at some point. There's a theological group called the Calvinists, and they will tell you truth about eternal security and the predestination of salvation for all those who will believe. And, and on many points, they're very right. And then on the other side, uh, there's another group called the Wesleyans or the Arminians, and they'll focus on the, the free will of our choice to accept or reject Christ, maybe even walk away. And on many points, they're right too. And so um, how is that, that they're both right at the same time? Well, I think these groups figure that if they are right, then the other is wrong. They figure that if I'm right, the other one can't be true. But they can both point to scriptures to assert their position. They're both pointing to the same Bible. We see it's just two sides of the same coin, that both this and that have merit in some ways, as long as we don't take that too far down the road outside of where the Bible has intended. It isn't either one or the other. It's somehow both one and the other, which I'm not telling you I understand, but it's just the way God works sometimes. In today's text, we're going to see how Peter experiences both the cost and the freedom of grace. In 
grace is another one of those paradoxes because it's free and it costs you everything at the same time. Grace is funny because on one side of the coin, you get that absolute just freedom in Christ and complete, you know, uh, pardon. And it costs you nothing. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. It's just free. And on the other side of that same coin, when you receive grace, as you grow into a desire, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you that entire life that you had, and you will have to forsake all if you want to be a Jesus follower. So it's a paradox. The mature disciple realizes that everything grace costs us, though, is no sacrifice at all to surrender it so that we could receive the best that God has been offering. But before we begin today, let's review the story of Peter up until this point. So we've been studying through the Gospel of John, and the setting we're in now is the night of the betrayal of Jesus Christ. After a long discussion of, uh, in, in prayer and teaching and time, they're walking through um, the, the desert night. They get into a garden after a, 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 a big dinner, and um, before the conversation, Jesus and his leadership team at that dinner were... Um, they were having was the moment that Jesus chose to reveal who his betrayer was and therefore set the events of the night into motion. So um, Jesus reveals that it's Judas that's going to betray him. And Jesus reminded Peter and the gang that it was that he was going to be arrested. He was going to be killed and raised to life again after three days. And if you were with us during the study in John 13, Peter responded to this by saying, Jesus, wherever you go, I will follow. If they're taking you, they're taking me with you. If you're going down, I'm going down too. He says, wherever you go, I will follow. And then Jesus said in John 13, 36, he says, where I'm going, you can't follow now, but you will follow later. And then uh, Peter said in verse 37, he says, I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. So he's saying before the rooster crows in the morning, you will act like you don't even know me three different times. Meanwhile, Peter's like, oh, man, I'll follow you to the death. It's the night, the night we're both going down. We recall that Peter was ready to fight to the death when the soldiers came to arrest him because last week, whenever we read in chapter 18, Peter took a swing at one of the soldiers with his sword, and he goes for his head and um, cuts off the guy's ear. So Peter was ready to fight. He cut off the guy's ear, and if it wasn't for Jesus healing that ear, we can ex expect Peter would have been arrested and even executed as well. But in that moment, Jesus taught Peter that the events must take place that night, the way they were foretold in Scripture. The issue wasn't whether or not Jesus was being forced to do something that he didn't want to do, but rather he was submitting to the will of God to do a hard thing so that a really great thing could take place in the long run. And so Jesus was arrested. And he was taken to the high priests who were preparing to have a secret false trial in the middle of the night. And that's where we left off in the story. So we're going to try to do this um, scripture reading through our, our program again. It was really fun last week, so I'm going to try it again this week. But here's the thing you want you to notice. We're going to, in this um, chapter, John tells the story, like, and he kind of cuts back and forth from different scenes. So like in one scene, he's talking about Peter and and, and, and Peter's storyline. And then in the next scene, he's talking about Jesus and Jesus' storyline and the arrest and what's happening with him there. And he cuts back to Peter and he cuts back to Jesus. And he kind of goes back and forth in 18. And so for us to stick with this one storyline for us today, um, we're going to skip some verses. So we're going to go through from 15 to 18 then skip to 25 through 27. And we'll come back next week to the verses that we skipped this week. See what I mean? So you're going to notice this as the scriptures are read off the screen. Go ahead. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. 
and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So let's review what we just read and unpack that just to clarify some language. Um, also, I can expand on some stuff because this story is recorded in all four Gospels. So if you read this story in all four Gospels, you get a bigger picture than just what John paints for us. So we'll review and expand a little bit. And we know that at this point, most of the apostles scatter when Jesus was arrested. So the soldiers, they scatter. And uh, they're probably freaking out, literally running for what feels like their life, or at least their freedom. They are guilty by association with Jesus, an accomplice in his defiance of the religious systems in power at the time. And it said that Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Scholars believe that that other disciple was John, the guy writing this letter. Uh, and so, um, so let's assume it was John. Um, he had some connections with the priests and was able to get access and then come back out to get his plus one, Peter. A woman at the door recognized Peter as a follower of Jesus and identified him verbally. Said, hey, you're a Jesus follower. And he said, nope, not me. I'm not a Jesus follower you got to have me mistaken for somebody else. I'm not following Jesus. And then Peter makes his way over to a fire to warm himself, and he gets spotted again. And uh, you imagine um, the, the, the scene. He's sitting there warming himself by a fire. Somebody comes up and says, hey, I saw you with Jesus earlier. Nope, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And then a, another guy, this guy's related to the man who uh, Peter took a swing at. See, Peter goes to uh, cut off that guy's ear. And one of his relatives were a part of that gang that night. So you can imagine he would be pretty familiar with the events that night. I mean, his relative almost got his head took off. So he probably recognized Peter pretty easily. And uh, he says, hey, I saw you with Jesus in the garden. Peter says, nope, not me. Uh, I'm not with that guy. I am not a Jesus follower. At which point the rooster crows. Epic crowing of the rooster reminds Peter of Jesus predicting earlier that same night that Peter would deny following him three times before the rooster crowed. See, Peter would have just experienced a very sobering moment as he stands by that fire and hears the rooster crowing, recalling just a few hours ago at the dinner, whenever he says, I would follow you to your death. And Jesus says, not tonight you won't. And Peter felt this, this passion whenever he was with his band of brothers as the opponents of Christ came to collect him, because he knew that the trouble he would get in for swinging a sword at a soldier, for sure. He wasn't clueless on how that would work for him. But now, after the band of brothers have scattered in fear, Peter's left to fend for himself, he wasn't feeling so bold, and he denies knowing Christ. And Jesus knew how it would go all along. Peter realized that Jesus knew in this moment that his life wouldn't match his words. He said one thing, but he behaved another way. That in this moment, he had made a commitment to Christ that he wasn't going to keep. He said, if tested, I will stand strong in my faith. But his life didn't match his words. Now, we've got to give Peter some credit. It's not knocking the guy too hard because he said he's been through a lot this night. And we can read to the end of the story. We know the history and we can read to the end of the Bible, right? So we can look back and see that Peter does eventually grow into a man of integrity whose words can be trusted to match his life. And Jesus says, you won't die for me tonight, but you will eventually, which was true. Historically, we know Peter does go to his own cross. Peter wasn't strong enough in his faith to give it all for Christ this night, but we know historically that Peter will die a martyr's death eventually. But between now and then in the stories, 
Peter will grow into a mature disciple whose life matches his words. But on this night, we see him failing due to weakness and fear. We see that he felt strong and bold in his faith when he was around a bunch of people who believed the same way he did. But it's another thing to stand up for his faith when he's around people who opposed his values and his lifestyle choice of a Jesus follower. Jesus just got done teaching Peter about a relevant paradox earlier this night when we studied in John 16. He says in John 16, 33, in this world, you'll have trouble. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. Jesus was teaching him about a peace during times of trouble and joy that this world can't take away. We read in another gospel account that after the Last Supper, Jesus took his disciples to the garden to await his arrest. And while there, he told them to stay awake and pray. While he went off to pray alone, he says, stay here, pray for me. We're going to need prayer tonight, so stay up, pray. And he goes off to pray alone. And when he returned, he found them sleeping. And he warned Peter to stay awake and pray because although his spirit might be willing, you know, otherwise he wouldn't have said the words, I'll follow you to my death. He knew that his flesh was weak. And he fell asleep again and again. And by the time the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, it was too late to pray for the strength to endure the ordeal to come. And Peter failed. No doubt his failure, this failure occurred to Peter as he was weeping bitterly after these denials. Peter learned this lesson about being watchful, and he exhorts us in 1 Peter 5, 8. He says, be on alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Peter's weakness had caused him to be devoured momentarily as he denied his Lord because he hadn't been prepared through prayer. And he underestimated his own weakness. Peter was one of two apostles who famously failed Jesus that night. The other, of course, being Judas. The difference between these two men was that Peter would use his failure as a motivator to get better. Peter would repent of his failure and be restored. Now, he wasn't comfortable with his sin of denying his faith that night. And he was convicted to repent, which resulted in him being redeemed. There has never been a sin forgiven that wasn't repented of. Oh, I think that one's worth saying again. There's never been a sin forgiven that wasn't repented of. Repentance is, what is repentance? It's to be sorry enough to change. Not just sorry because you got caught, or sorry because you're experiencing consequences, or, or sorry because you know somebody noticed, but sorry enough to change. That's repentance. Eventually, Peter would not only strengthen other disciples, but he would become a pillar of the early church and train others to follow Jesus. His examples and his letters in the New Testament continue to empower believers like us today. As with all our failures, God used Peter's many failures, including his three denials of Christ, to turn him from Simon, a common man with a common name, to Peter the Rock, who would be part of the foundation of his early church family. Jesus understood the weakness of Peter, and he also understands the severity of sin. So he expects repentance of us. He didn't say perfection from us. He said repentance of us. Imagine standing outside while Jesus, your Lord and Master and Brother, is being questioned in this way. You're going to be terrified. You're going to be shook. Imagine watching this man who you've come to believe is the long-awaited for Messiah being abused and beaten and humiliated. Naturally, Peter was confused and scared. It's a serious sin to disown Christ. But we'll read at the end of this letter that Jesus forgives Peter. No sin is too great for Jesus to forgive if you are truly repentant. He will forgive even the worst of sins if you turn from them and ask for his pardon. So the question then becomes for us, how do we relate to Peter? How do we relate to Peter in this story? Well, let's start with the denial. Are there ways that we're denying that we are a follower of Jesus Christ? Maybe for some, you know, when directly asked, you too would be ashamed of your faith, too ashamed to identify yourself as a Christian and say, I'm not a Jesus follower. I'm not like them. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. That seems like the most obvious example, right? And that usually won't take a Christian long to mature past that place. 
And even the new believer tends to get so on fire that they just want to talk about Jesus, talk about Jesus, and they'll tell Jesus to anybody who will listen, maybe a few people who aren't interested in listening, that new believer fire. So what are some other ways that we might be denying that we know Jesus? Jesus tells us in Matthew 28 to go out and make disciples, which of course starts with people believing and then growing into a mature Christian from there. Paul tells us in Romans that people won't believe if they don't hear the gospel. And for them to hear it, somebody needs to go out and tell them. So then are we denying that we know Jesus by being a passive person? who's not investing in making disciples. We believe here that there's no such thing as a mature disciple of Christ who's not making disciples in Christ. When you become a mature disciple, you'll desire to actively invest in the spiritual formation of others. If we're not actively investing in the spiritual formation of others, well, I think you're getting my point. we got some growing to do. That's okay. We all start somewhere. We can use Peter's story as an example. So we all start somewhere, and that could land somewhere pretty nice. What's another way we could be denying that we are a follower of Jesus? Well, the next one's probably the worst possible way that we could deny Jesus in our life. When our life does not match our actions, whenever we lack integrity, we're denying Christ. One of the worst things a person can do to the Christian faith is to say you are a Christian and not act like. When a person who identifies as a Christian looks more like the people of earth, it hurts the reputation of Jesus Christ himself. A lot of people judge Christ based on the behavior of Christians. The problem is that we all have some growing to do. And so we are an unreliable um, source of Christ's reputation at a po- up to a point until we have fully matured in Christ. And even then, we're still subject to failures and sin. Opponents of Jesus, such as those who like are non-believers, right? Standing on the outside of our fellowship, throwing rocks at us, accusing us of things that they don't really understand. That really doesn't do much to hurt us. Persecution, historically, has not tended to hurt the church. Persecution, historically, tends to move Christianity forward and force Christians to dig in harder to their faith. Persecution tends to benefit the church. I know that sounds paradoxical, but it's a message of paradoxes today. Persecution has a way of sifting the real believers from the ones who are Christian by word only. And as regards the real deal believers, persecution tends to drive us deeper into our commitment and drive us deeper into our fellowship with each other. Persecution makes our faith very simple. These things like we talked about earlier, Calvinist versus Wesley, whatever, all become irrelevant whenever there's real hot persecution on the church and just the the, the core things that made us Christian unite us in such a fundamental way that everything else seems irrelevant. Persecution makes our faith very simple. It separates the real deal believers from the fakers and it filters out all the divisions and unifies the body of Christ in a significant way. Those outside the congregation don't hurt us too badly. But my observation is that the ones who tend to do the most damage are the ones who would tear us down from the inside out. Folks who would create division in the church. Gossip, slander, fighting, undermining. Or the folks who would go out from here into their daily lives and claim Christ but live otherwise. Folks who claim Christ but are drinking, getting high, swearing, fighting, acting greedy, acting miserable acting hatefully, and just living in open sin. These folks do more damage to the body of Christ than persecution ever could. Because when the outsiders look at them and they see no difference between them and the rest of the world, they wonder if the God we claim is really all that powerful at all. Our lifestyle is our testimony. Now, Jesus is no fool. He doesn't expect us to get it perfect every time. And as we look at the experience of Peter, we can find some comfort knowing that Jesus has our back through this. As we look at the experience of Judas, we can see that Jesus doesn't play around with sin either. And especially when a person's life doesn't match their words. There are examples in other Gospels, especially, 
where Jesus is preaching to these religious leaders and these hypocrites. And he does it losing his mind. You read these sentences. He said, you brood of vipers, kind of like, you snakes, you hypocrites. And he's going off. Like, there's exclamation points at the end of those sentences. He's, he's losing his mind. You hypocrite. Because it blew him up to see people leading people spiritually while living hypocritically. Who, their life didn't match their words. Their hearts were far from God and they were influencing people spiritually at the same time. It drove him wild. Every time, read it for yourself. You brood of vipers, you hypocrite. He was losing his mind as he would rebuke these religious leaders. He really didn't like it. We look at the experience of Judas and Peter, and they both denied their Christ that night. We look at the examples of these high priests and these religious order that God himself established. I mean, they were church-going folks who knew scriptures and were working in the community, but they were opponents of God because they refused to repent of their sin and acknowledge their need for a savior. It's a scary place to be. Instead, when confronted with the uncomfortable feeling of conviction of sin, they dug into their sin harder and harder, disconnected from a fellowship of real believers, and attacked that fellowship of believers, and ignored truth that they've got to surrender to this uh, conviction. And, and instead, they became harder and harder to the gospel. So with all that in mind, what can we apply from what we've learned here today? How do we take what we've just learned from the Word and apply it to our own lives? Well, one thing's for sure, that we can all sort of start out at this same place, right? These broken sinners who need our lives radically transformed by a power greater than ourselves. Without that, we are doomed. And we all value integrity, right? We, when a person's words don't match their life, we, just by nature, will respect that person a little less. I didn't say forgive. I didn't say love. I said respect. You lose a little bit of respect for people whose words don't match their life. It's natural. So we all value integrity. And we also need to be radically transformed by the gospel and grown into a place where we can be counted on by our Lord. When somebody says you can count on them or whatever, and then they let you down, you remember it because we value integrity. Nevertheless, as Christians, when we first start out, We've got some growing to do. That salvation is just where we're getting started. Salvation is not the finish line. It's where we're just getting started. Because how could we trust a God who promises us a better afterlife if he can't deliver a, a better life here and now? In fact, he does promise us a life now full of joy and peace and unity with personal growth and character and integrity. We, and we experience this new life now as we grow through repentance. So the story today convicts us to look at the ways in which our life doesn't match our words. Evaluating the ways in which our life is denying that we're disciples of Christ. And once that reality is on our minds, then we've got a choice to make. Do we dig into our sin like the Pharisees? Live a lie about our need to repent. Dig in with our pride, never changing and feeling falsely secure because of our religious traditions. Or do we let our negative feelings about the sin in our life drive us to a place of guilt so strong, we just avoid the feeling altogether and start disconnecting from the holy things that remind us of the sin in our life. Disconnecting from the fellowship, disconnecting from the presence of the Lord. Or do we commit to a life of integrity? Allowing Jesus to grow us and repenting of our sins, the ones that he had to die for. Do we go all in, leaving this old self behind and growing in humility and being vulnerable and admitting we had done some wrong? And Peter had been walking with Jesus for years at this point. Peter, in that time, he had walked on water. He had seen countless amazing miracles, and yet he still had some growing to do. He has seen the incredible works of God, but he wasn't there yet. He still had some growing to do. So don't let your shame stop you. Peter had the knowledge. He walked with the Christ. He heard this guy teaching every day. He knew in his head, and he had seen marvelous stuff, the likes of which most people only get to read about, but he still had some growing to do. So don't let your shame stop you. If you're feeling like, you know, I know too much to still be in this place of sin. And if I was to admit it now, I'd be really embarrassed. Well, then you and Peter can relate. 
Because confession is a big step forward towards repentance. Now, a final point before I wrap up. Because this message is funny. It could have gone in a couple directions. As I was praying through the text, it was clear that this was the message for us today. But there was another sermon we could have done out of this text. So I noticed that Peter, he was very brave and courageous. Courageous enough to take a swing at a soldier whenever he was with his, his team. But alone, he was too afraid of even a little girl by herself next to the campfire in the middle of the night. And what that tells me is that we are stronger together. We are not going to be able to do it alone. We need each other. And it's not just about integrity. My life didn't match my words. But like we make each other stronger. So when we do outreach together, it will be better because we can encourage each other. And when disciples get made by disciples, there's something to that, right? That it's a relational thing. Like this Christian community stuff matters. And the, the gathering matters. And the small group time matters. And us hanging out with each other outside of those things. It all matters. It all matters very much because without that, we are going to be at such a loss. We're going to be at such a disadvantage. But with each other, man, just about anything's possible. Like Peter, ready to take a swing at a soldier's head with a sword whenever he was with us. He's feeling bold. He's feeling good. But alone, man, there's a little girl next to a campfire. He couldn't even stand up for a stand. We're stronger together. We can't do it alone, showing the value of a church family while living on mission. And I think the reason why God didn't choose that message for us today is because you've heard me say that a lot of times by now. We've been talking about that a lot over the last few weeks. And so I hope you get that one by now. And, and for whatever reason, God felt like this message on integrity was the one we needed today. So at this point, I'd like to give us an opportunity to respond to God's word. And I'd like to offer you some prayer. And if you'd like, you can even come up here and get prayed on. Uh, maybe the message convicted you in a specific way. You're thinking to yourself, man. Here's a way in which my life is denying Christ. I am saying I'm a Christian, but man, people wouldn't know it if I had to prove it in the court of law. Or maybe there's just something you just got some repenting to do. It's time to repent. Today's the day. Or maybe there's something else. Maybe it has nothing to do with the message and you've just got a, came in here with a burden and you're hurting and you just want some care and some prayer. Whatever it is, now's a good time. Now you can come up and get it. You can pray there. And while we pray, um, my wife is going to continue to lead us through music. So you're welcome to pray or sing, uh, however you desire to continue worshiping the Lord in this time. And uh, uh, as we move forward.